I'd like to begin by um, thanking Trinita for a very kind welcome, and um, I also wanted to say that I think it's a little bit unfair um, to ask me to deliver a paper after um, such a wonderful performance. Um, the Dominican Sisters of St. Cecilia are a very hard act to follow, um, but I will, I will try. And I will actually hope to return the favor by showing lots of images um, of Dominicans and also St. Dominic. <clears throat> And um, I should also say that our manuscript has never sounded quite so good, and I wonder if we can borrow your audio for um, our future exhibitions of um, the Jacobellis manuscript. Um, I'd like to thank again uh, Trinita Kennedy and the Frist Center for the generous invitation to present at this symposium. There are three Getty manuscripts and one painting, as Trinita mentioned, um, on view in the galleries upstairs, and they all look really wonderful in the context of such beautiful and related works, and so I thank them also for that opportunity. And finally, I would like to thank um, my Getty colleagues, Elizabeth Morrison and Brian Keene, for traveling from sunny and warm Southern California um, to Nashville uh, to support me in giving this paper. In 2011, the J. Paul Getty Museum purchased a storied 13th century Italian Bible from the golden uh, age of Bible illumination in the orbit of the University of Bologna. Named after Major J.R. Abbey, its owner from 1965 to 1989, it had previously been owned by another prominent English collector, Charles W. Dyson Perrins. Yes, indeed, the Liam Perrins, Worcestershire sauce fame. <laughs> Produced only a few decades after St. Dominic's death, the Abbey Bible is one of the earliest works of Dominican art. This Bible, currently on view in the Frist Center galleries and gracing the cover of the catalog and also the exhibition brochure, it is part of a tradition of Bible illumination in Bologna in the early years of, me of the mendicant development in that city. Its myriad illuminations were executed by the most accomplished artists active in the period of the mid-1200s, a time of rapid growth of both the Dominican and Franciscan orders. Historically, Dominicans and Franciscans have been discussed as rivals. Scholars have most often considered them separately and in isolation from each other. While certainly many inherent differences exist between the Order of Friars Minor and the, orders of Friar, the Order of Friars Preachers, the Sanctity, Sanctity Pictured Exhibition is the first to bring the objects they produced together and to highlight the connections that exist between them, rather than purely the divide. Among these objects is the Abbey Bible, a manuscript whose initials and margins teem with biblical narratives and playful vignettes including portraits of Dominican friars, sometimes side by side with Franciscans. As I will show, the pages of the book offer insights into the types of texts and images desired by these communities and reveals the relationship between the two orders at this early moment in their histories as they pursued the mendicant life. Examining the Abbey Bible closely and in relation to works produced in its Bolognese context reveals that it is a direct product of a largely unrecognized partnership between the two orders in Bologna. The city of Bologna was the site of the first university in Italy when it received its charter in 1158 from Frederick Barbarossa. And Italian scholars have argued, in fact, um, the crest of the current University of Bologna states this very clearly, um, that the university was actually founded much earlier in 1088. It became part of a larger network of universities being founded in Europe at this time, including the University of Paris and the University of Oxford. And I'm showing you here two tombs from the Museo Civico in Bologna, belonging to two famous professors from the University of Bologna. On the left, the tomb of Giovanni d'Andrea, and on the right, the tomb of Giovanni da Legnano, a lawyer and jurist who died in 1383. Both tombs attest to the owner's role as the professor of law, as a professor of law at the university, by depicting his students at their desks arranged in a fashion that I'm sure some professors in this room have perhaps seen before. <laughs> on the right dutifully um, checking their textbooks against what the professor says. And this perhaps uh, may in fact be a Bible that they're referring to, while others sit head in hand, um, representing students deep in thought. Or perhaps not thought. <laughs> um, and in terms of the, um, the Bibles that they consult, or the books that they consult here, it is in fact perhaps um, Bibles that they are, they are referring to. 
Bologna and its scriptoria supplied texts to both academic and preaching communities throughout central Italy. The Abbey Bible, in fact, displays glosses in the hand of the main scribe that provide exegetical commentaries on various passages. This reflects the system in Dominican schools at the time where students heard one daily lecture on the Bible and one on Peter Lombard's sentences. After peregrinations across Europe from north to south, the Spanish canon Dominic Guzman settled in Bologna in 1218, eventually establishing the convent of San Nicolo de la Vigne, close to the southern wall of the city. And if this um, model of um, Bologna confuses you, it's actually oriented with south at the top. <laughs> if you know Bologna at all, don't be um, alarmed. Um, this is actually a, a scale model from the um, Museo Civico in Bologna that's quite useful. And um, San Domenico is right um, sort of back, sorry, right here, um, back in this area. And I'll return to this a little bit later on. Um, the convent was established close to the southern wall of the city. At his death in 1221, the church became Dominic's final resting place, and his body was eventually enclosed within an elaborate tomb, within an elaborate tomb sculpted by Niccolo Pisano in 1267, and elevated in order to allow more access for pilgrims who flocked to gain um, access to the founder of the Dominican order. And this tomb and its um, uh, movement and, and new placement is discussed very well by uh, Trinita and also by um, Donald Cooper in, um, in their catalog essays and, and elsewhere. Indeed, there are several indications in the Abbey Bible of its Dominican patronage. To begin with, the prologue and the beginning of the book of Proverbs of King Solomon, um, which I show here. In the um, sort of very central most image right there, we see the standing, a standing Dominican friar pointing to a book um, that he himself forms the shape of the letter I, beginning Jerome's pro uh, pr uh, prologue to the book of Proverbs. Question is, why a Dominican at this particular point in the text? The book of Proverbs is, of course, many of you know, I'm sure, is all about gaining knowledge and proper learning, which we know is, of course, of central importance to the Dominicans, especially in Bologna with its university context. In the beginning, the initial of the biblical text proper um, shows a crowned man, and now I'm just referring to this scene right here, which I realize is not very big. Let's see, do I have another scene? No. If you can zoom in um, just a bit, you might be able to see that um, there is a crowned man sitting sort of on a throne. Um, this is pre presumably Solomon, and he actually holds a switch up in front of a half-naked boy. Now, I don't know if this is a reflection on Dominican disciplinary practices, um, but it is a direct interpretation of the text, certainly. And the text um, that follows slightly thereafter says, listen, my son, to, you, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. And finally, in the lower margin, a bearded elder preaches to a group of men who seem to kneel before him. Of course, this also refers again to the instructive tone of the book of Proverbs, but also here in this particular context in the Abbey Bible, it amplifi amplifies the context, um, or rather the concept of preaching and its central role in Dominican spirituality. Now, although I have referred to the importance of the Abbey Bible in the context of the Dominican order, and of course also the university context of Bologna, in general, such lavishly illuminated manuscripts um, as the Abbey Bible um, and in fact here executed by such a skilled artist, are very likely to have been sponsored by a single prominent patron. The 1989 Sotheby's sale catalog for the manuscript suggested that the manuscript was perhaps commissioned by Teodorico Borgognoni, a Dominican friar and bishop of Cervia um, from 1270 to 1298. The date of his death on Christmas Eve, December 24th, is noted in fact in the calendar of the Abbey Bible. However, this was not the only manuscript that Borgognoni commissioned, and he did mark another book with his likeness. And here he is at the base of the page. This is a choir book um, from the Church of San Domenico, the Biblioteca di San Domenico in, Flor uh, sorry, in uh, Bologna, and it is a book with, um, referred to as a curiale and a sequentiary, so it contains um, various chants used during the uh, performance of the Mass, hymns sung during the Mass. Borgognoni was buried in San Domenico, and I should say 
before he was buried. He was actually um, a doctor. Uh, in fact, uh, he, was a, he was a surgeon and had, present, had um, prepared some works um, or text, uh, written texts on, on surgical procedures. Um, he was eventually appointed bishop of um, Bitono by Innocent, Pope Innocent IV, but he declined to take this position. Rather, he preferred to stay at his home in Lucca, apparently, uh, much more attractive. Um, but in 1270, Innocent uh, appointed him Bishop of Cervia, and he did accept that post. And then um, upon his death, he actually um, was buried in the church of San Domenico in Bologna, and um, also left the funds for the creation of a new set of choir books for San Domenico. And in fact, the Curiale is one of these um, such choir books. And I just wanted to um, zoom in a little bit here. You can see that the image of um, Teodorico is inscribed Frater Teodoricus, right over the head of, in fact, St. Dominic. And you can see um, that um, Teodorico Borgognoni presents his manuscript directly to, um, to St. Dominic, in fact, on, on bended knee. So quite clearly marking the book um, and, and hoping for the perpetual prayer um, in his own afterlife by the community of San Domenico, the community of Dominicans there in Bologna in perpetuity. I should also note that the Sotheby's entry also suggests that the Abbey Bible was made for the community at um, Ascoli Piceno because of the reference to St. Emigidius in the calendar um, of the Abbey Bible. And the feast is actually paired with the feast of St. Dominic on August 5th in the calendar. Um, and so um, that very particular um, use of St. Emigidius, who's a very local saint, helps localize the Bible and, and its use to, um, to um, um, Ascoli Piceno. Now, with such an overwhelming devotion to Dominic in the city of Bologna, one would think Franciscanism wouldn't have a chance in this context. And yet, in 1222, Francis himself came to Bologna to preach. He was very well received, but stayed for only one night. Uh, apparently, this was a long enough stay, um, since to commemorate this brief visit, Francis's followers erected a church on the spot where he slept. <laughs> And um, while the large Dominican context was developed within the city walls, which I showed you before is right up here, right here is the Church of St. Francis. And what you're looking at here, this inner core, are the medieval walls of the city. So um, there is St. Francis just fuori le mura, so just, just outside the walls. <clears throat> As, uh, Trinidad, excuse me, as Trinidad has pointed out, at the time of its completion, the Church of San Domenico became Bologna's largest church, larger than the city's cathedral, in fact. That is, until the Church of San Francesco was completed in 1250, when it measured 295 feet and three inches, which is 13 feet and one inch longer um, than the Church of San Domenico. <laughs> Always competing, those two. And I can just show you this um, Google Maps version. It helps you see the dot is actually this um, sort of horizontal piece is the nave of the Church of San Domenico, and you can see San Francesco here, similar in size, but ever so slightly bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Emerging from all of this context was the resplendent Abbey Bible. The Abbey Bible is a substantial volume, as you'll see upstairs in the exhibition, written and illuminated on, fo on 514 folios of parchment, much of it very fine in quality. The Abbey Bible contains 95 historiated initials, 80 leaves that display vignettes in their margins, and 39 decorated initials. The initials containing figural scenes preface the books of the Old and the New Testaments, which means that basically every few pages there's some sort of painted decoration. In addition to the, obviously, as you can see, um, also on this page down the center of the two um, columns of text, um, very elaborate blue and red pen-drawn designs that emerge from the initial letters. The illuminations represent a very accomplished form of what art historians refer to as the first style, or the primo stile, of, Bo of Bolognese illumination, which, la which lasted from around 1250 to about 1274, and this wasn't sort of a, um, a strict uh, time period in terms of um, illumination style, so the secondo stile, or the second style, was also overlapping a bit with it towards, towards the end. In the case of the Abbey Bible, it's certainly um, 
and I'll just jump ahead here, um, displays many of the different elements that you would find, in fact, in um, this Primo Stile illumination. I'm just going to step away from the Abbey Bible for a moment to show you um, another uh, Bolognese Bible we have at the Getty Museum um, from the Ludwig Collection, Ludwig, Ludwig 111, um, off showing many of the details that you would find in this uh, style of illumination. Um, Again, each opening sort of decorated with um, an initial. This is the prologue. This is the initials to the main text. And then extending into the border with these wonderful marginal designs. And of course, the letters themselves are enlarged to include um, figural decoration and narrative, narrative scenes. And here I bring back the Abbey Bible. Um, next to one of the manuscripts that it's been closely compared to, which is um, a Bible in the Biblioteca Nacional. In, um, in Madrid, and you think you can see the very similar type of um, mise en page, the arrangement of the text and image on the page here, and in fact, the very similar type of border design. We're going to see this um, repeatedly throughout the, throughout the manuscript. Um, in the case of the Abbey Bible, however, um, we have one additional element which you might be able to sort of glean from this particular image that I show here. Um, this is actually bringing in, in addition to the typical Primo Stile elements, also many elements of Byzantine art. Um, and so um, we have a very, sort of the figures are very much, look very much like they've stepped right out of Byzantine icons. So this is really um, the epitome of this style in a very particular mode of this, um, this artist, actually these artists who are responsible for, for the Abbey Bible. And now back to the Abbey Bible in earnest. Wow, exactly, <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> the opening of the biblical text of the book of Genesis that you see here on the screen makes, in fact, a dramatic first impression. Myriad scenes, figures, and foliate decoration fill the inner margin of the text of the right-hand page that you see on the screen. And the large roundels with boldly patterned borders fill the lower margins of both pages. In the opening, um, with um, in the opening, and then there are additional scenes interspersed throughout, which we'll have a look at. Starting first with the beginning of the text of Genesis, we actually have here um, a very, very large initial I for in principio. Um, in the beginning was the word, and so forth. We all we all know how Genesis begins, um, and so the form of the letter actually. Um, winds up um, giving birth to these various scenes from creation. And if you do a quick count of those scenes, you'll find that there are not seven of them. <laughs> there are eight. And that is because um, the artist actually includes this scene right here of the temptation in the Garden of Eden, of Eden and taking the tree from the fruit of knowledge. Um, and this is key because it's very um, uh, part of the point of this page is to connect it with the scenes that you see in the lower margin of the page. Along this lower margin of the page, and we're starting on the left-hand page up top, and then just extending right, sorry, left to right, and then in the same fashion along to the um, bottom of the facing page. We have various scenes from, excuse me, Christological um, stories from, from the life of Christ. Um, the main ones that you see here are um, the Nativity, you have the Kiss of Judas, Christ preparing to um, mount the cross, the Crucifixion, and the three Marys appearing to the angel at the tomb, and he, of course, tells, her, tell, tells them that, that Christ um, is, in fact, uh, not there, um, and so this implication of his, of his resurrection. Now, these scenes are fairly standard, but interspersed between them are all these tiny additional figures here um, throughout, sort of filling out the entire, um, basically the lower border of the entire frame. So, for example, in the case of the nativity scene at the upper left, you have the um, standing, standing in for the figure of um, essentially the midwife that you see in a lot of narrative scenes. You have um, roundels where, in which they're squeezed in representations of angels holding cloths over their hands, as you might have um, a midwife at a birthing scene. And you also have, additionally here, very tiny, um, a couple of shepherds, it's hard to see, but there's their, their flock right there. Um, and they're raising their hands and looking towards the scene of the nativity above. So you have a very, very abbreviated scene of the Annunciation to the shepherds also squeezed in there um, in those margins. And of course, there are additional angels that, um, that are also interspersed as you sort of go um, from left to right over across the page. Now, the two scenes of, um, the two zones of decoration, I should say, the initial for, for Genesis and all of these scenes that appear across the bottom of the page 
So you have Old Testament scenes and New Testament scenes that run along the bottom. They're really hinged on a scene that appears at the bottom of the initial eye. This is the bottom of the initial eye here. And if you can see what we're looking at, this is actually a scene of the Annunciation. So you have um, the angel Gabriel and Mary coming, of course, tell her that she's going to give birth to Christ. And that there is linking all the history of the creation of the world to, in fact, um, to Christ. And so this, these scenes of um, ending with Adam and Eve are linked to then um, Christ as, as sort of the new, the new Adam and Mary as the new Eve. Um, and so, um, and I should say, by the way, in, surrounding this are the symbols of the four evangelists. So immediately, again, signaling and reemphasizing, even at this beginning of the Old Testament, the New Testament um, gospel stories that will follow um, towards the end of the manuscript. <laughs> one additional scene, oh sorry, there had a blow up of it, now, now you can see it. <laughs> and there's one additional scene at the very upper right hand corner of the um, right hand folio. Um, and of course what you're seeing here is a scene of the entry into Jerusalem. Joseph stands with a sort of rucksack over his shoulder and leads the Virgin Mary and Christ as the family flees into Egypt. The donkey marches along with a very lively gait to the right mirroring the direction, in fact, of our reading of this book and encouraging the reader to turn the page and proceed through the text of Genesis. Um, it's a much simpler sort of decoration that we've seen in the lower border, um, and it has a much more delicate frame, um, part of which has been um, truncated. As you can see, the, the manuscript has been trimmed slightly um, and so um, we've lost part of the, the frame that must have been around it originally. Um, but it also um, sort of, um, I should say, makes it sort of seem a little bit more light and playful than the rather iconic scenes on the lower margin of the page. And it's a precursor to the lively border scenes that we'll see in the rest of the manuscript. Overall, such a complex interchange of scenes and theological meaning found in the illumination on these pages represents really the highest level of book decoration produced in Bologna in the late Duecento. Now, throughout the Abbey Bible, the interplay between text, the introductory initial, and the border decoration continues throughout, um, and sometimes, in, in fact, almost always, in very, very engaging ways. And I just wanted to show you a series of these so that you get a sense of what it's like to page through the Abbey Bible and what it must have been like to read the various scriptural texts that comprise it. This page shows the opening to the book of Deuteronomy, and the first letter of the text is expanded to include a scene of Moses striking the rock and water issuing forth. The Israelites then scramble to gather and drink the water. And now the story, um, if any of you know your Bible very well, I see already people shaking their heads. Um, this story actually comes from chapter 10 of the book of Numbers, <laughs> so not Deuteronomy. Um, it's unclear if this is sort of um, you know, lack of space in the Deuteronomy initial or misunderstanding. Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not being critical here. Um, or simply a need to just show more scenes from the book of Numbers. In the lower margin, which I'm sure you can already see, is a wonderful scene and always in the Abbey Bible, it's always helpful to start with the initial and then turn to the border scenes. In the margin below, the group, a group of fishermen stand on a bank and pull in their fishing net, heavy with squirming fish. Um, and you can see they're doing this with all of their might. They're really straining themselves. Now, does the scene direct, uh, directly relate to the initial above? Well, other than the theme of water, perhaps seemingly no. Um, but does it relate to the book of Deuteronomy? And that's, uh, the answer is perhaps. Chapter 14 of Deuteronomy does outline Jewish dietary restrictions, uh, stating that one is permitted to eat any fish with fins or scales, but not otherwise. And that's certainly what we see on the page here. But it seems to me what it also calls, recalls perhaps most directly is from the Christian context, is something from the Christian context in which this Bible was used. It's the miraculous catch of fish from the Gospel of Luke, where Christ instructs Simon Peter, who had not caught a single fish all day, to lower his notes and then they suddenly, uh, sorry, to lower his nets, I'm still stuck on music, um, to lower his nets and they suddenly come up bursting and he needs to call upon his companions for help. And so you see this group of um, figures gathering fish right there. This scene that I show right here is from the opening of the first book of Chronicles, and um, there's a similar relationship between text and image, except it takes it one step further than the actual text. So you have in the initial five men who stand together, and this could refer to the generations and the genealogy um, that's listed in the text, extending from Adam all the way down to Saul. 
And so although the text never actually mentions Eve at all, it's all the male, male pre, uh, generations, um, you have clearly um, the fact that generations cannot proceed without women. <laughs> so um, in the border is shown um, the means by which there is that first generation of, of humans. So you have um, Eve being taken from um, the rib of Adam and, and being in this act of creation in the lower margin with God um, uh, sort of summoning Eve um, from Adam's rib. Here's the opening to the book of Judith. And I think many of you will immediately recall the story of Judith and Holofernes, which you have happening here. She sort of wields this heavy sword, and she's about to behead him as she grabs him by the hair. Um, and below is a scene in the lower margin where Christ appears to Mary Magdalene as a gardener. And of course, at a certain point, she recognizes him, and she reaches out. And what does he say? Don't touch me. <laughs> and perhaps, or noli mi tangere. And this is perhaps a humorous play on the manhandling that Judith gives to Holofernes above. <laughs> now, this is my reading of it. You can take it or leave it if you like. Um, but the very playful nature of these scenes in the Abbey Bible certainly um, does play into this. And of course, again, you have the Old Testament story with New Testament story below. So this constant um, reference back and forth um, typologically. And I couldn't resist showing a couple images from the opening to the book of Job, everybody's favorite whiner. Um, <laughs> here you have um, Job on his um, bed, attended by his friends and his wife and some servants. And then below, Job um, covered in sores and tempted by the devil. So actually just a further um, elaboration on, on this particular story. So not, um, not a typology, but just elaborating on the story. This occurs as well in the Abbey Bible. And again, following the text fairly verbatim, is the beginning of the book of Jonah and the story of Jonah and the whale. So in the initial, Joseph sits in the boat, and below in the lower margin, we see Jonah um, naked and um, either devoured by a fearsome looking whale, or else he's actually being spit out of the whale um, three days and three nights later from, from the whale's belly. And of course, um, this was seen by medieval Christians as allusions to Christ's death and resurrection three days later. Now, some of you may have noted that the splashy beginning of the book of Genesis that I began with um, actually appeared on folios 3 verso and 4 recto of the Abbey Bible. Um, perhaps even more compelling in the context of the papers today is the frontispiece to the manuscript that appears on folio 1. This is um, displaying Jerome's letter. The beginning of the text that you see here is Jerome's letter to Paulinus, Bishop of Nola, introducing his um, translation of the Vulgate. And you see up here um, Jerome, in fact, passing his text to a wee figure. Do I have a nice picture of him? Yes, I do. Um, this is no ordinary Paulinus. <laughs> he looks very familiar to you um, from the wonderful um, uh, sisters who were just up here on the stage. This is, in fact, a tiny figure of a Domin um, Dominican friar who's receiving this text from Jerome. Now, of course, this never actually happened in real life, um, but I think it shows very clearly from the outset of the manuscript the patronage of this manuscript. It's, it's marked from the very first initial in the book itself. At the base of the page, is a wonderful scene of, here we go, first time in the manuscript, Dominicans and Franciscans together. And what you see happening in these scenes are each of um, St. Dominic here and St. Francis giving their respective rules of their orders to their followers. And so the sort of, <clears throat> from the outset of the Bible, in fact, you have um, the giving of the rules and the um, idea of this very um, central role of the rules to both of the orders and how they would sort of conduct their lives, of course, after the death of their, of their founders. Let's see here. And um, the scene of the giving of the rule of um, both the Dominicans and the Franciscans appears in a multitude of imagery, um, especially manuscript illumination from this time and later. Um, it's a common theme. There are scenes of um, Francis giving the rule to St. Clair. There's a wonderful image in the Morgan Library of that. Um, there was another um, uh, manuscript recently up for sale from the same collection from which the Abbey Bible most recently came um, that shows the receiving of the rule of St. Dominic. Um, and so um, this is a theme that, that is very important to the iconography of both the Franciscan and Dominican orders to establish um, the real validity of, of, their, of their rules. And I wanted to point out here before I move on that um, the Dominicans here wear the very characteristic um, white robe and black mantle. 
But the Franciscans, however, I think today when we often think of them, we think of sort of a brown habit. Um, and certainly th this is referring to a more modest color. But if you look in the Abbey Bible, in fact, what you see are many different shades of gray. And this will actually appear, um, just keep this in your mind, because this will, this will keep coming to the fore as we look at several other examples. Or maybe not so many, since I'm nearly at time. <laughs> um, and I wonder here if I could sort of skip ahead. This is, of course, the fascinating image that's in the um, exhibition, and I think that um, Trinita talked about it quite, quite well um, in her introduction. Um, this particular opening that you see here where you have um, the real face-off of the Dominicans and the Franciscans is the beginning of Psalm 97, um, which um, is someone that um, I think relates quite closely to the theme of the, of the, um, the day today. Um, sing to the Lord a new song. And in fact, you do have the choirs of Dominicans and Franciscans assembled um, below in the lower margin of this page. Um, let's see if I can just jump ahead here. So at first glance, the two groups are presented as mirror images of each other, although the Franciscans, in fact, do appear slightly greater in number. Each group faces a lectern that supports a book that displays a schematic musical text um, and also some notation, if you can pick that out. Let's see if I can get a little bit closer here. There we go. Their arrangement in the margin conforms to the presentation of the drolleries in the margins of many of the pages in the Abbey Bible. They're contained within roundels, as you can see here, formed by those curling vines that we've seen several times. And these uh, vines arc and curl over the heads of the friars, enveloping and forming leafy canopies over their heads. They're differentiated, the two groups, really by the, um, uh, the, two diff the characteristic dress of the two orders. And again, here the Franciscans more in a, a gray rather than a brown. As uh, Trinita noticed, uh, noted, also the Dominicans are placed slightly higher than that of the Franciscans. And also the Dominicans are the only ones who actually appear to be singing. Um, with the friar at the front, um, sort of seeming to turn the pages and the one just behind him raising his hand to his ear as if to stay on pitch. I think we've all done this at a certain point. Um, Christ emerges from the vine scroll that envelops the two um, different orders of friars, and he leans towards the Dominicans so that he might bless them. Um, as Trinidad noticed, um, we also see that this places them at the right hand of God, and the Franciscans are treated to a lovely view of Christ's back. What's more, the Dominicans are closer in scale to Christ and therefore appear to occupy the same picture plane as he, while the larger scale Franciscans seem foregrounded into the space of the reader and therefore, in fact, more removed from Christ. And this is actually a common way to illustrate this particular psalm in the, um, in the Old Testament. And I show you a couple of examples of other Bolognese Bibles. In fact, um, we have here um, Ludwig 111, which I showed you briefly before, again showing monks um, and this is uh, just slightly later than the Abbey Bible, um, singing from a, a manuscript there, Dominican Friars. And in the Bentivoglio Bible, we have, um, and when this is actually also on display upstairs, not this particular page, we have Franciscan Friars gathered around a manuscript and, and singing um, at the moment of this um, Sing a New Song text. In his 2013 article on the Abbey Bible, Fabrizio Lolini suggested that this apparent confrontation between the two orders may actually represent something far more nuanced. Their relationship was one of agreement, as the Lolini calls them, two towers, one faith. This idea of integration of the orders rather than isolation can be taken several steps further in the Abbey Bible, for the presence of the Dominicans and the Franciscans together does not end with the two pages I have just discussed. And so I'm showing you here two images from the Bentivoglio Bible, and I think you'll be able to see quite clearly on the lower margins that we have, in fact, um, Franciscan friars throughout the manuscript. This is much more typical. But in fact, in the Abbey Bible, as you start to leave further, you see several instances of texts where um, the Franciscans actually appear in the initials. And I'll just show you a couple here. I realize I'm getting close to time. This is at the um, beginning of the um, second book of Maccabees and also um, in one of the uh, letters of St. Paul to the Corinthians. As Martina Bagnoli points out in her first catalog entry on the Bentivoglio Bible, Jerome's letter to Paulinus that prefaces the Bible text proper encourages the study of scripture. 
practice of preaching, and also poverty. Therefore, the margins surrounding this very text are the perfect locus for these images and um, of the very people who lived these, these principles, namely Francis, in the case of the Bentivoglio Bible, and for the Dominicans and the Franciscans in the Abbey Bible. Now, I was discussing the um, Abbey Bible very recently with Fabrizio Lolini, and he suggested a sort of, um, and I think um, Trinita talked about this a bit, but the sort of one-upmanship in terms of um, the Dominicans and the Franciscans. One sort of, um, as he saw it, developing a certain type of iconography, and then the other order adopting it and taking it a step further or refashioning it for their own um, patron saint. And I think that's what you see here in the case of another leaf that's in the exhibition. This is um, a Dominican um, antiphonary leaf from the Getty Museum showing the death of St. Dominic. And you see here these various worshipers who have come to the deathbed of St. Dominic, and we can also think of his, his tomb, um, in order to receive the healing power of this, of this sanctified individual. And I had the good opportunity to see the manuscript on the right recently in um, Brooklyn at Borough Hall. There was a wonderful exhibition on um, St. Francis, which some of you might be aware of. And um, many manuscripts came from um, Assisi, and this was one of them, showing uh, Francis in his tomb and the same sort of configuration of individuals coming to his tomb to receive the healing power of Francis. So, um, and these are roughly contemporary with each other. So again, um, very similar iconography playing off each other and kind of competing in, in that way. I'm sorry, and there's a wonderful um, detail. Not so wonderful on the right, that's from my cell phone. <laughs> And I wanted to go back to the opening of the Abbey Bible and to show you one additional scene um, that seems to take a cue, even though it's a Dominican Bible essentially, it, takes, it seems to take a cue from Franciscan imagery. And I want to refer specifically to the scene right here with Christ disrobing. And some of you might be familiar with the work of Anne Derbis, who noticed that um, in the origins um, sorry, the origins of this particular iconography of the disrobing of Christ as he's about to mount the cross, and it's coming um, essentially from Byzantine art, but does take off, in fact, the art of the Franciscans. And of course, this gesture recalls the story from the life of St. Francis, who was a son of a textile merchant, as many of you will know, who famously divested himself of his rich robes in the public square at the, as a gesture of poverty and humility. And this uh, theme is beautifully depicted in the fresco cycle in um, the Church of San Francesco in Assisi, but I couldn't also resist um, including the rendition of the event from Franco Zeffirelli's 1972 a Brother, Son, Sister, Moon. Um, it sort of sets up it as a very dramatic climax of the movie, really the turning point of the entire movie when Francis um, divests himself and walks out of the, of the city um, and into a, a, brand new, a brand new life. So although our discussions today focus on Dominicans and Franciscans and their activities on the Italian peninsula, and sort of, or rather I have focused on the very early period, I just wanted to um, uh, show Trinita, I know she really wanted a Fra Angelico, so I brought her a Fra Angelico, um, of Francis and Dominic um, meeting here. This is a wonderful image of the Madonna of Humility, and here we see Francis and Dominic almost shaking hands um, and showing, you know, opposed, but also um, in good concert with, with each other. And the virtual face-off of orders that you see in the frontispiece from Psalm 97 um, seems relatively rare, and I, I was talking with um, Professor Lolini about this a bit, um, and I had the good fortune to be in Bologna and really see the context of the Abbey Bible, and we were talking about the face-off of the Franciscans and the Dominicans and how he really didn't have another example of that occurring. Um, and then I had a wonderful tour of the city of Bologna by uh, my good friend and colleague Paolo Cova, also um, a, a researcher at the Museo Civico in Bologna, in a whirlwind tour of the city, and we um, darted through the church of San, Santo Stefano in Bologna and came across um, this likely roughly contemporary with the Abbey Bible fresco um, in this niche, and again, I have to apologize, this is my, my cell phone photography at work, um, this wonderful image of um, the Virgin and Child, and if you can see carefully on the sides there, we have on the sides of the niche, St. Francis receiving the stigmata, here's the seraph, and San Domenico. 
And so um, even in the city of Bologna, even in the church context, there was this pairing of Francis and Dominic outside of just this particular, um, in other words, the Abbey Bible is, is, I think, not isolated. And I think um, if further attention is given to this subject, there will be more and more examples in Bologna that will show this partnership between the two orders. And to conclude, the Abbey Bible contains a wealth of imagery and introduces a rich series of text-image relationships between scripture and the scenes that fill its introductory initials and the margins of its pages. These are complex combinations of images, some of which I have parsed out here, but many more remain to be considered. The type of understanding necessary to pick apart what appears on the page is very much in keeping with the Dominican desire for close, um, uh, sorry, for close consideration of the Bible and study of the Bible and a focus on learning through scripture. And while the, bro the book is marked throughout with images of the Dominican friars, who likely were the intended audience for this book, Franciscans also make several appearances, more in fact that has been, than has been previously noted. These two early mendic earliest mendicant orders were certainly rivals for gathering followers and arguably had different approaches to spirituality. But also at their core, they held to the same ideals of poverty, preaching, and outreach to the local community of lay people. They took cues from each other and circulated in the same devotional ambit in many cities in Italy, such as Florence, Siena, and Bologna. In the Abbey Bible and in other Duecento, Trecento, and Quattrocento images, Dominicans and Franciscans share spaces. The margin of the manuscript page, um, an architectural niche, a single panel within a larger polyptych. In this way, the Abbey Bible may express in microcosm the tenor in Bologna in, this early stage, in, in the early stages of development of these two mendicant communities. Indeed, much like the Sanctity Pictured exhibition accomplishes in its galleries and its catalog. Thank you. And if we have any questions um, for Christine, you can please come up to one of the two microphones here at the front of the auditorium. Um, and we'll just take a couple here before we break for lunch. Thank you for that lovely paper. Thank I you. actually have a question about this image that's on the screen. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> the first question is, was that a niche that held a tomb? And secondly, you said the church was San Santo Stefano. Mm -hmm. What kind of church is that? Well, it's a very complicated church, as you probably know. Um, it was designed as um, sort of um, uh, on the model of the um, the, the Holy Sepulchre. In, um, and, you know, it's, it's a... a Sort of, a, and I wish I hadn't run through it as quickly as I had because it's a, it's a almost a complex of churches. So, um, started with a central core that was meant to evoke the um, Holy Sepulchre, and then more and more bits were added to it. So, as you walk through the complex, you feel like you're entering church after church without ever leaving the building. Um, and so, um, I would really have to look into more, you know, really sort of look at a plan of how this all laid out and exactly. Um, Paolo believes that this is this is the part of the church that's contemporary with the Abbey Bible. It had several building phases, as you might as you might guess. Um, and I do not know if there was a tomb in there, but I think it's it's quite likely. I do, she's saying there was. And I'm reading her lips from here. Oh, yeah. No, it really it really does. And I think um, that certainly has to be um, looked into more. And you know, what is the connection there? And what was the meaning for this dual Francis and Dominic for that individual who um, sort of laid claim to this this space within within the sacred space of the church? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I'm interested in the fact that this is the first time that um, the Franciscans and the Dominicans are really studied in context of each other, mm -hmm. as you guys have said. And I'm curious what inspired you guys to do that or to begin looking at um, them in this way, and also why it wasn't done before, what kind of scholarly trends or research trends made it so that it was siloed. Trinita, would you like to <laughs> speak about that? I'm glad to be on the coattails of Trinita, but this is very much her idea to, to bring these together. Uh, 
Well, yes. Um, I, I had actually done a lot of research about the uh, Franciscans um, over the years, and a lot of the contributors to the catalog had as well. And um, it was actually, I will have to say, Nashville that kind of inspired um, the addition of the Dominicans. Um, we were thinking of ways to make this particular exhibition uh, relevant to our community, and we realized that the Franciscans' contemporaries um, were right here in our city, so um, I, have, <laughs> I have you to thank for that. Um, and then it just became so obvious once I started thinking along those lines that you could really enrich the dialogue in new ways um, by you know, looking at an image of St. Dominic's death side by side with St. Francis's. And um, just over and over it was um, really revealing to me. And actually art historians do this all the time, they compare and contrast, but um, they really hadn't done this very much. Um, and one of the reasons really is, is that um, uh, scholars of this period look at works of art in such depth that they will write a, a book about you know, one manuscript or um, one fresco cycle. And that in itself is so much work that you, know, you can't even think about, um, <laughs> about trying to compare it to other works of art. But when you have a team of scholars like we did, you know, 14 people um, working on this um, project, this isn't really something that one person could have done alone. So um, I'm also grateful to all the contributors for helping me. And it's also true that this is just skimming the surface. I'm painfully aware that there are so many other um, themes that we could have explored in the exhibition. Um, so hopefully this is the start of um, more studies like this. I just wanted to add that, um, you know, given this opportunity, it really did, did open my eyes to the Abbey Bible. Um, my colleagues who are here, and Elizabeth Morrison and I were certainly um, involved in the acquisition of, of the Abbey Bible, and so I, I know it quite well. I looked at, through it um, with the um, previous owner, and it, it's a um, wonderful, stunning manuscript, but really given the opportunity to think about the Franciscan and Dominican connection, opened my eyes to what was happening in this Bible, and I have to say that um, it seems that a similar thing might be happening in our other Bolognese Bible as well, as I just discovered, so um, it, I think this really could be expanded quite, quite a bit further. Um, you brought uh, attention to the color of the Franciscan robes, uh, how they were a gray color, uh, and then you also brought uh, attention to Christ's disrobing. Was there any significance to the color of Christ's garment uh, to the Franciscans? Yes. <laughs> I was racing through at the end, but I think that's absolutely true. That's the other um, connection that you can see here is that, um, in fact, the robe is gray. Um, and so I think um, that really really ties together um, this um, idea of Francis's life and his story with Christ as, and, and Francis, of course, is Alter Christus, um, sort of the, you know, the new Christ. Um, and so um, he, in fact, takes off what appears to be a Franciscan habit. Yeah, good point. I'm sure you all want to eat. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>